Hey, do you want to get strong? Of course you do. Do you want to develop an incredible back and posture your chain? Do you like to be as strong as you look or look as strong as you are? Well, the program for you then is MAPS Strong. This was inspired by strongman training. So you're developing your body, you're building incredible muscle, but you're also functional. You can move, you can lift things, and uh, you're basically awesome. And today we're giving away free access to one of you lucky viewers to MAPS Strong. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. And here's what I want you to do with the comment. In today's episode, we talk about the best two exercise combos for every body part. Here's what I want you to do in the, in the comments. Put down your favorite combinations of exercise for body parts, but explain why. Don't just put a combo out there and expect people to understand. Tell us why you like the particular combo. Make a good case. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to Map Strong. but you also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications, okay? Do all those things, and again, if we pick your comment, we'll notify you. Also, we're running a sale this month on a workout program and on a workout program bundle. So the program that's on sale is MAPS Anywhere. It's an equipment-free workout program. All you need are bands and your body weight. Get a great workout, build good muscle, sculpt your body. And then the bundle that's on sale is called the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. Now, bundles are already discounted. That's why they're bundles. But you can take an additional 50% off that as well. So huge savings all month long. If you're interested, you want to learn more, you just want to sign up because you're smart, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code NOVEMBER50, NOVEMBER50, no space for that discount. By the way, all workout programs that we sell come with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you can literally sign up, do it for a month, and if you're not blown away by your results, return it and you'll get a full refund. So very, very cool. We know you're going to enjoy this episode, so here comes the show. I think... It's important, and we do this a lot, right? Because we trained so many everyday people. We always try to put in perspective, like the average person, what they're going to do, um, what they're not going to do, and that mm -hmm. really tailors how we communicate our information. Because it makes no, it makes no sense to communicate th this crazy information if we know that the average person is not going to do it, or it's just not going to be feasible for yeah. them, right? Yeah. So I think for the average. Not fitness fanatic, but for the average consistent person who works out, who's interested in building their body, sculpting their body, their health and fitness, it's probably very realistic to talk about like the two best exercises, combos you could do for each area of your body. Because I think the average person, or at least the average person I'm talking about now, person who's relatively consistent, it's probably what they're going to do. They're probably going to go to the gym, train their body, and they'll do two exercises per body part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So which two do they pick? Why pick those two? Like, why are they so valuable? And, you know, I have a bunch off the top of my head that I've yeah. written down that I know are always great two exercise combos, but I think this will be a great conversation. Well, I always like to reduce it down to relatable things, right? And I think we've learned that as coaches is, uh, you know, what, whatever we can do uh, from all the vast amounts of education and different types of techniques out there, like what had the most value to us personally and also to our clients that's, you know, more relatable, something that they can replicate fairly uh, easily. So I think that, you know, this will be good. At least like something you can apply right now at the gym after you listen to this. I think that'd be rad. Totally. Well, I, I can't wait to see you lead this because I'm curious to see how much we all agree, like how much your combo, all of us go, oh yeah, that's a great combo. Or I've got one for you that I really, really enjoy because we t we've mentioned some of these in the past on the episodes and I always get somebody DMing me like they go and they apply it at the gym right afterwards and they're like, oh my God, yeah. that felt so amazing or got the most massive yeah. pump from that. Yeah, ever. and I'm going to predict that uh, you and I are probably more similar, Adam, because you and I have more of a bodybuilding approach. Yeah, I know Justin, Justin will have to throw a fucking wrench in everything. Yeah, he, well, well, he's more of a performance guy, but it, but there's tons of value in that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And what's important to understand is, because I mean, how many times we've said this, right? Not all exercises are created equal. Some are far more effective, give you more bang for your buck than others. Well, when you start to add exercises together, the formula actually gets more complex. There mm -hmm. are exercise combinations that are far more valuable than other exercise combinations, even if the independent pieces measure the same. In other words, you could do two very effective leg exercises that on their own rank very highly, right. but as a combination are inferior to another 
two exercise combination because of how they hit the body and the parts of the body that they work, for right. example. Right. And you'll feel the difference too, right? Yes. Like based off of like what your focus is. And so I think that it'll be interesting at least. I want to put in some perspective of like if I'm, you know, focused on something else like power or trying to generate more uh, force versus just getting a pump. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, let's start with legs, right? So we'll start from, with the biggest body parts, I guess, and move kind of the smaller ones. If I had to pick two exercises, and I, I do want to be clear, um, ideally you want to do uh, other exercises that are more individualized here or whatever, but we're picking just, just two here. And in my experience, the best two combined exercises you could do for legs, if you go to the gym and work your legs out, you only do two exercises. I think a barbell squat, we've talked about the squat many times, mm -hmm. works the whole body, very functional, get this huge muscle building, metabolism boosting kind of payback from doing them in comparison to other exercises. And I think if you combine that with a Romanian deadlift, Romanian deadlift is a phenomenal, what's called posterior chain exercise, right? So it works the glutes and the hamstrings. It works on hip hinging. Mm -hmm. I think when you combine those two together, the sum is equal more than the parts. You get this tremendous benefit from doing both exercises together for the lower body. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I love squat is king. And, uh, you know, obviously deadlift has its uh, place in terms of like the posterior chain. If I was to like look at it in, in terms of a hip hinging movement that gives you like that power and is able to really like stimulate a, 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 an insane amount of, of force to generate for this too. A lot of times I like to incorporate like a heavy kettlebell swing for a few reps just to really get that type of, uh, you know, power and speed and snap. And then, you know, I'm, I'm really waking up the CNS and then moving that into a squat. I feel even more activation from my muscles. Being so involved. you're going to go swing to squat. That's swing your combination. By the way, these aren't supersets. This is like you do your sets with no. your, yeah, same with mine. You would do your squats first, three sets or whatever. And then later do, you know, in the workout, do the Romanian deadlift. So I, I think that's a great combination. In fact, I think on a recent episode, we talked about uh, starting a workout with kettlebell swings. I think it was a, a qua where someone asked a question. So I like that one, Adam. Uh, yeah, well, you and I are going to be on the URI on the same page. The only, I think, one slight modification that I would say to the, the squat is because the Romanian deadlifts are posterior chain heavy, I would, and squats still get a posterior chain involved, I may actually do like a hack squat or a front squat with that. Oh, like, yeah. So, but I mean, mm -hmm. you can't go wrong with squats. It's like, that's one of my favorite combos for sure to include in almost every leg workout that I do. And it's for the point you said, I mean, you just, you're, you're attacking the entire leg and you're not missing out. And both of them are good, heavy or exercise that you could heavy load and really get after it. Yeah. So. In, in fact, I did this with my consistent clients. This was a very common combination for legs where they'd come in and, you know, and these are people that would hire me for three days a week or more. So they're the more consistent people. This was a very common combination we did and everybody just got phenomenal results. And if I have limited time to work out and can only pick two exercises, these tend to be the ones. That now, are, are we going to uh, specify too on the order that you would do them? Like, yeah, I think that's important. Okay, yeah. so in this I case- I don't think Romanian deadlifts before squats is a good idea. No, the so only reason people, why yeah. I would do that is if I have somebody with, uh, like a, for example, I was just helping uh, an old client of mine out who's trying to develop her hamstrings mm. and she's trying to bring those up. And right. so- They're too I, quad dominant. Right, she's very quad dominant. She's trying to be, her, she's trying to work on her posterior chain because she's trying to work on developing her hamstrings more. I might flip that. So that's the only case where I would flip it is I'd say, okay, let's do the Romanian yep. deadlifts first because I want I want more energy, more output for that exercise. Plus, now I'm kind of pre-exhausting the hamstrings before you go do something like a back squat, mm -hmm. which still gets some that's hamstring. A, that's a really great point. I will say this, that if, if that's the case, the second exercise, you probably want to go lighter and focus more on, on technique and form, right? But 100%, in fact, all of these exercises, we put them in the order that is ideal for most people, but there's always exceptions to the rule where flipping them might be. And I'll try and make that like when it, when it comes up, like that's a that just popped in my head because I literally just had this conversation. I said, hey, when you do your Romanian deadlifts and squats, I know normally I would have we have them program squats first. We yes. almost always will traditionally program that way, but there is always exceptions to the rule when somebody has a very specific goal, which is she's quad dominant, she's trying to develop her hamstrings. Yep. In this case, that's a simple thing that you can do that'll just help help her in that direction. Totally. All mm -hmm. right, so now we'll go to back. Okay. One of my favorite, just two exercise combos for back are rows, typically a barbell row to pull-ups. And if someone's not strong enough to do pull-ups, I'd have them do a pull down or assisted pull-ups. Now why both these exercises? Okay. So rows, 
really do well at strengthening the entire back, but really focusing on what's called scapular retraction, pulling the shoulder blades back, which for most people is a very, it's, an, it's a function of the back that needs to be focused on with exercise because so many of us have forward shoulder. So I'm going to start with the rows because forward shoulder is so common. I want them to focus on those mid, those mid back muscles to really give them kind of better posture and then pull-ups, pull-ups or pull downs, but especially pull-ups, great lat exercise directly works the lats. Mm -hmm. And then from a body sculpting and muscle development standpoint, you're hitting the whole back when you do those two exercises in combination. Rows to pull-ups, it's like mid-back development. You still get some lat development. Now you're doing pull-ups, mostly lat. Just this wonderful kind of well-developed back you'll get from that combination. Yeah, so, I agree with that. I think from my perspective too, like in terms of like going in that order of like, I'm, I'm going to try and get like some fast twitch muscle involvement to really ramp my CNS. Uh, you know, you could turn that row into a pendulate row. Uh, and that could be something that you could apply, you know, going before the, you know, the pull up also too. I mean, I know that deadlifts aren't necessarily, you know, considered back exercises, but I'm not, I'm sorry, it's steal yours, yeah. but uh, <laughs> let's say trap bar uh, deadlift, just because, you know, for me and working with athletes, um, you know, this is something that I feel like risk reward and less time teaching. Mm. Uh, you know, this is one of those um, sort of hacks that was was really helpful for me. Uh, and, and so to load, a, you know, a trap bar deadlift substantially, then then have them move over to to lat pull downs, man, or uh, uh, sorry, uh, pull ups. I think that the, that's a deadly combo. So we're uh, we're all again close, uh, almost on the same page. Uh, I mean, this is for sure. This is actually my favorite combo of all exercises for anybody part is the deadlift to the lat pull down. The mm -hmm. only reason why I'm I'm uh more lat pull down is because the, the deadlift is so taxing. Right. And after like doing, you know, three to five sets of like heavy deads, going to do pull ups is tough. Is tough to do. Although I will say if you've never experienced that, it's actually kind of crazy how much you fly up on the first set. Like after you've done, if no one's ever done this before, and we've talked about this on the show where you go do like a one or two reps of a heavy deadlift mm -hmm. and then go do a pull up and you'll feel like you're 50 pounds lighter. Yeah, so there is that. But if I do three to five sets and I'm doing more like five to eight reps on deadlifts, so I'm a little more gassed and fatigued. I love to go over to the lap pull down and do that right after. And what I love, and I know that, you know, with the rows, like both of you guys are saying, you know, pin lay rows and then a traditional rows, you're getting more scapular retraction and- mm. I know you're not getting as much of that, obviously, with a deadlift. <clears throat> yeah, but, but you're working the mid-back. like. Crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah you're yeah. able to load it significantly heavier, and you get even more erector spinae moves, too, because that's how much you're trying to load the low back. So you talk about feeling the entire back pump. I've never had a back pump like heavy deadlifts right over to afterwards yeah. finishing my deadlift sets going over to lap pull down. Well, is and the, the one thing I guess of being the functional guy here too that I always kind of consider as well is like where I can add elements of rotation and you know with the rows like having just like a single arm row but with added rotation like mm -hmm. getting that you know scapula to, 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 to go through all those ranges of motion I think is important and so you know if that's an opportunity where you want to include that it's a good place to do it. Yeah now why would you do pull ups first? You would do pull ups first if you had a, a back that was developed that lacked lats. So you got the mid back strength, you got the upper back strength, but you lack the lat, you know, width or whatever, <clears throat> in which case pull-ups first uh, would be perfectly fine. I would not have somebody with really bad forward shoulder do pull-ups first though. I would have them do rows first yeah, or deadlifts totally. first. Yeah. But yeah, the, the combo that you said, deadlifts and pull-ups, I did that for years. That was yeah. one of my favorite combinations. It's a nasty one. It is. And it really works the entire back. I got really well developed muscles from it. Uh, I don't think you're missing much uh, by doing that. I want to elaborate a little bit more on Justin's. Like you know, like I said, there's always exceptions to the rule, and um, I love because you actually just you named the exercise that we put in Maps Performance, right? So we did that where you're kind of split stance and you're doing the kettlebell with a rotation yeah. in there. Yep. And so here's where this this depends on the client. If I have a client where we are more functional focused, right? So I'm working on their movement. They don't they do a lot of things in the sagittal plane, or maybe they sit at a desk all day long. They're not trying to be a bodybuilder or get the most bang for the buck as far as building tons of muscle. They're, I'm looking for overall performance and movement. Um, this is where I think that trumps it. Like that, that's a no-brainer to go that direction to add some sort of a anti-rotational component 
to the back exercise, which if we do what Sal and I were saying, they're very basic, like sagittal plane movements mm -hmm. where you're not incorporating that. So again, there's always this exception to the rule on what the client's goal is. If I'm just thinking best pump, build most muscle, most amazing feeling, like I'm going deadlift, flat, pull down. Mm -hmm. But if I'm like, I've got this client, which by the way, is probably more the majority, advanced age, you know, mm -hmm. had low back pain maybe in the past, like just wants to feel so good. A desk job. Yeah. Like there, that is going to be a, a better overall exercise, regardless if maybe the other combo might give you a fraction of a bit more muscle yeah. or pump. Yeah. No, to be more specific with the row pull-up combo, um, I used to like to do supinated grip uh, rows to overhand mm. pull-ups. Mm -hmm. So I do the, you know, Yates style row, great uh, straight yeah. pull-ups and I just get this great, just this great uh, feeling in my back. All right, let's go to chest now. I th and this is a common one. It's a common combination, but I think uh, it's good to explain why this is a good combination. Uh, a press and then a fly. Okay, so let's get a little bit more specific. I think a low incline uh, chest press is more functional and m will produce better aesthetics than a flat bench press. Now, I know I'm, I'm you know, being a little sacrilegious here, um, <laughs> blasphemous, I should say. Yeah. But the whenever you do any kind of pressing motion in sports or whatever, it more closely mimics an overhead press or an incline press than it would a bench press. Very rarely are you kind of pushing in this direction. From an aesthetic standpoint, when you see a well-developed chest, uh, actually, when you see a chest that's not well-developed, what you tend to see is a, a lower chest development with lacking upper chest development. That slow incline gives you a fuller, broader looking, more aesthetic chest. There's more function, I think, uh, to your, that type of pressing. Mm -hmm. Then when we go to flies, I like a flat fly because the stretch you get on a flat fly really spans the entire rib cage. Now, why the fly to the press? You know, with a lot of exercises for certain body parts, you tend to get these common combination of muscle groups, right? For pressing for the chest, it's always chest, shoulders, triceps, right? Any press, barbell, dumbbell, incline, flat, decline. It's chest, shoulders, triceps. And muscles start to kind of learn to work together. A fly is actually chest, shoulders, and biceps. When your arms are open and you go down on a fly, it's your biceps that are connecting with the chest. It produces a different feel. The tension's different on the chest. Mm -hmm. And then the stretch. The stretch at the bottom of a fly is not something you can achieve with a press. Presses, you're typically limited by the bar or even by your shoulders. But when you bring the weight out and you come down, you get this really good stretch on the chest. The press and fly combo, it's a classic one. Bodybuilders have been doing it since probably oh, the, yeah. the 50s. And it's one of my favorites. It's magical. And I mean, I could get cute and and, <laughs> and, 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 and you know suggest that you do some kind of like med ball chest passes, like something to kind of get that power movement out. But honestly, I would... I would stick with just the tempo uh, focus with with the bench press, and maybe even do an incline version of that. So you know, I'm I'm bringing the bar down, but then I'm, my focus is like is powerful of a press on the concentric part mm. as possible to get that you know focus of like uh, you know I'm really trying to kind of move the weight quickly and effectively, and then you know I'm going to transition over to probably like an alternating fly version of that just because I like the stability, the control, the isometric component of that while getting that stretch at the same time. Great combo functionally. So that the only thing I was going to change was actually, uh, I like, this is where I love cables. Like a cable fly after mm. this exercise is just, just because it keeps constant tension, yes. right? With the with the dumbbell fly, obviously when you're at the top of the movement, you, you lose a little bit of that tension or, or as much of the intention as you would if you were actually doing a cable fly. And I love the alternating. I was going to say though, Justin, I mean, it, you, obviously a med ball press would be a little ridiculous to think that that's going to replace a dumbbell or a right. chest press, but you could do like an alternating dumbbell press to get some anti-rotational component in yeah, there and sure. you could still go pretty heavy sure. uh, with that. And I love to do that. I'm with you, Sal, too. I, and I don't know if I'm biased because I saw uh, the greatest change in my own chest aesthetically when I really started to focus on incline. I also think, too, there's that, um, I think we've talked about this, that the incline bench, whether you're doing barbell or dumbbell, just puts your scapula in a more advantageous yep. position. It's less technical than it a bench is. press. It is. Flat and flat, there's more likely going to be a little bit of a breakdown or the shoulders rolling forward or issues with the shoulder kind of clicking or something. So um, I I love doing a heavy either dumbbell or, or barbell press and then going into the fly. My only adjustment to the fly, which by the way, I do both. But my favorite would be to do the, the cable fly right after that. Yeah, and that. the feel is different with dumbbells than with cables, right? With with dumbbells, your focus should be... By the way, with flies, 
the goal should not be to go as heavy as possible, whether you're using cables or dumbbells. The goal is, is form and technique. You go heavy, you're going to turn it into some kind of a weird press. But with the dumbbells and free weights, the emphasis is on the stretch. This is where most of the resistance is, right? There's not very much resistance up here, but when you're at the bottom, it's about the stretch. That's the value of the free weight fly. Now, the value of a cable fly is, I would argue, more in the squeeze position, mainly because you don't get the squeeze in the chest with really any free weight exercise, right? Mm -hmm. You don't really get that full squeeze. And so if you only ever do free weights, you may actually be very strong in the stretch and then mid-range position, but then all of a sudden you lack this kind of short range of motion, this, this, this squeeze position with cables mm -hmm. because the resistance is the same all the way through. You know, what I like to do with cables is I go lighter yeah. than I would with flies. And then I'm like, my goal is to squeeze as hard as I possibly can with every single rep and focus on that contraction in the middle. And it is a different feel. Well, that's, you mm -hmm. just alluded to why I would make the case why I like the cables even more is because I think you can get a little bit of both where the, the dumbbells are a little more limited, right? Dumbbells, like you said, it's just, you get the most out of this exercise when you're in the fully stretched position. Yeah. I still can get that with the cables and I also get the squeeze. And so that's the only reason why I prefer uh, it a little bit more, but I think both of them, and I think the order is uh, one of the best things that you could do for your chest for sure. Yes. Now let's get to shoulders. I think there's going to be a lot of people might be surprised that there's a particular exercise missing from this combo. And I'll explain why here in a second, but let's start with the first exercise. I think it's hard to argue a better overall shoulder strengthening and building exercise in a, a standing or even seated, but I'll say standing overhead press, right? An overhead press all the way down to where it's down to the upper chest. Of course, remember, everything's got to have good stability, control, and mobility. Mm -hmm. And then a full extension, like you are working that shoulder joint through a wonderful expression. You're working the entire shoulder. It's going to develop good strength. It's going to develop good muscle building. You get a decent amount of mobility with a good full standing overhead press. Okay, so what's the second exercise? A lot of people would throw in a, a standing lateral or what they used to call back in the day a side lateral, right? Mm -hmm. Lateral raises, very common. Got to hit those side delts. No. I think it's a great exercise. Not saying you shouldn't do them, but if you're only going to do another exercise and we're doing two exercise combos, I'll argue all day long that a rear fly is a superior exercise to complement an overhead press. Mm -hmm. I think with a good overhead press, you get a lot of anterior delt activation, that's the front. You get a decent amount of side delt activation, especially at the top. Very little rear delt activation. And if you just if you just did overhead presses and laterals, standing laterals, which a lot of people do, yeah. this is the most common combination, I would say, is overhead press and laterals. You develop this kind of sloping forward shoulder look. You don't get the round, aesthetic-looking delts, and you lose a little bit of functionality because those rear delts are also very important and neither one and the rear delts are not really active in either one of those exercises so yeah. overhead press rear fly develop a wonderful round well developed shoulder and it's it's more functional than if we did overhead press to mm. standing normal side lateral yeah two things uh i guess that i would you know add to that in terms of like a functional perspective like so if i were to add any kind of fast twitch movement there i mean this is a great place for a push press um, oh, yeah. and, uh, but in terms of like functionality, again, adding rotation, uh, I actually prefer like a single arm, you know, a, a rotating press either with the kettlebell or with a dumbbell either way. Uh, but uh, that way I could really kind of focus on my posture and making sure, you know, my shoulder is packed and I have, you know, everything sort of in good alignment. Uh, and I go through that full range of motion, that spiraling type of a press, I think is massively beneficial uh, to express all the different, uh, you know, components of the shoulder and then kind of moving that over again. And I agree with, with you know, the, the rear delt kind of focus because the natural tendency would be to do a, a, a side, uh, a, a lateral raise yeah. is what we call it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, side lateral. I'm, try, I'm trying to get in the bodybuilder <laughs> lingo. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, so, uh, and I think chest supported. I like, I like doing those over the bench, you know, if I was just kind of focused focus with that so I could really just kind of yeah. hone in on getting the right technique of that with the dumbbells. Uh, I know Adam's probably going to go with the cable. I'll let you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I'm actually going to kind of combine what both of you said. Uh, so I love, uh, I, no doubt, no, I can't, I, I can't imagine someone trying to over uh, argue the overhead press or at least some, some form of the overhead yeah. press. Right. So, and I love the idea of the push press. I'm going to add a little bit to that. A push press 
with an emphasis on the stability at the top to where I would make you hold for like three seconds and then come back oh, down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about hitting the entire shoulder and that, that after you get that explosiveness, you get the fast twitch that you were alluding to at the top, after I get it fully pressed, I'm actually going to hold and stabilize for about three seconds and then reset, come back down and press again. One of the most amazing shoulder pumps. And then this is, this is talk about one of my favorite combos. Uh, it is going to the the pull throughs or the rear flies on the cable. Um, I've done a video on the Mind Pump TV channel. It's been my favorite rear delt exercise, and I just love uh, the, how it takes the muscle through its fullest range of motion. And I feel like I get this constant tension and a massive pump in the rear delts, which I feel is a, a more difficult exercise for people to get pumped. I think a lot of people when they do uh, rear delt flies. They, it's uh, it's the opposite of how we do chest stuff where you are wanting to stay in this retracted position. Like when you do rear flies, you want to be in this kind of protracted position when you do the fly, which I think is just counterintuitive totally. for a lot of people. And I think that the when you do the, the pull-throughs, like it forces that, right? So when I'm hinged over, it forces my shoulder forward. So it just makes it uh, more advantageous for somebody to keep their shoulders in that position. And I just love the pump. So I love the push press or overhead press with a focus on the stability on the top and then right into a rear fly yeah. on the free motion. Now, you could make an argument that you could replace, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to say could. I don't think this is great for everybody, but I think for somebody that's got a good connection to the rear delt, you could replace a rear fly with like a face pull where you're you know, pulling uh, yeah. almost like a W. Mm -hmm. You are getting good rear delt there. You're also combining the biceps. You're also getting other parts of the of the shoulder. So it's a different you know, combination of muscles rather than shoulder and tricep, it's shoulder and bicep. Now, if you don't have a great connection to your rear delts, uh, I don't know if you should necessarily do that. I still think it's functional. You're just not going to work the rear delts as well. But I can, I can make my rear delts really work mm -hmm. on a face pull. And it's yeah. more of a compound lift. Uh, than a rear fly, so you that, just have to watch the elevating shoulders. Yeah, with that, yeah, that, that one's happens. a little more complicated. Yeah, totally, so I, but I do. I like the fact that you both, you guys, both put emphasis on the rear delts opposed to going the lateral, which would be this kind of the traditional way that everybody yes. goes. And I think, uh, aside from that, the laterals are getting some work uh, in the overhead press. I also just think that the rear, the real rear delt is one of the most overlooked parts of the shoulder. And you totally. made the point about talk about getting this full shoulder look. It makes a huge difference. You can really tell somebody who's developed their rear delts you could see it when they got their shirt on they're just standing there i mean it's it yep. sticks out on the back and it just makes the whole shoulder and arm look so much better you know what adam is funny uh when i uh, as a trainer occasionally it wasn't super common but occasionally you would get a client that would want to develop a specific part of their upper body right usually it was you know i want to lose weight and you know uh, overall but every once in a while we get a client and say my shoulders. I really want my shoulders to stand out. I have women tell me that. I had men tell me that. And what's funny? I would. I was really good at this, and all I would focus on was rear delt development. I didn't develop their anterior delt or the side delt. It was the rear delt. And once the rear delt developed, they were like, "Oh my god, I've been doing you know laterals and presses forever, and all of a sudden my shoulders look so round." It's like because the rear delt plays a huge role. In, the, in how your shoulder looks visually. A lot of people don't realize that. I mean, I think it plays a huge role in how the entire arm looks because I, mm -hmm. I did the exact same thing. It was a, a weak point for me. It was an area that I worked on and made my shoulder look totally different. It also made my arms look totally different. I'll never forget laying off all the arm work that I was doing at that time in my life, focusing on the rear delts, and then getting compliments about my arms looking better. It just pulls the entire arm together. If yeah. you get a nice rear delt on someone, you get that spade or kind of real bubbly round look on the shoulders, it makes the arms look more defined, well, it too. it sets you in good posture, too. That, so too. This is what I like about it. So it many great kind of helps you to kind of present yourself in a lot better light, uh, which I, I think people, like, discount that a lot. Like, mm -hmm. if you're in good posture, you look a lot better uh, just walking around. Totally. It, such a good point. I remember that was an exercise that I used to do with clients when we I do assessment with them is I would, I would like, you know, we'd be standing in front of like a mirror and I'd be assessing them and then I would put them in perfect posture and I'd be like, just look, you look like you just lost 10 pounds yep. just by standing upright. Totally. All right, let's talk about the show muscle. You know, the one that you <laughs> instinctively flex if someone says, show me your muscle. Yeah. The bicep. Now, with the bicep, uh, it's interesting. Some muscles, combinations make more of a difference than, than other muscles. Biceps doesn't make a huge difference, but there's still a difference with the exercises you want to pick. Now, I'm going to start with the overall muscle building barbell curl. It's just a general bicep building exercise. 
It's really good for overall strength and function. I think it's hard to beat if you want to compare it, you know, exercise to exercise in terms mm -hmm. of developing, mm -hmm. you know, nice biceps. All right, what do you combine with that? So this is, I think we might all have a difference here and you're probably all yep. just as valid. I like hammer curls. Now here's why I like hammer curls. When you're doing barbell curls, whether it's an easy curl bar or a straight barbell, your hands are pretty much supinated, meaning the palms are up. And that's definitely a, a function of the bicep. But oftentimes when you're grabbing things in real life, you pick up your kids, you grab something, pick it up, your hands are not supinated. They tend to be sometimes also in kind of this neutral position. And when you do a hammer curl in this neutral position, you are working the bicep. You're also working the brachialis, which is a muscle underneath the bicep, which a lot of us don't focus on. And by the way, you develop your brachialis, you get this really nice side look to your bicep because it kind of shows here through the side. But you also develop another elbow flexor. A lot of us don't realize it exists, which is the brachioradialis muscle. It's the top of the forearm here. When my hands are neutral, or especially when they're pronated, the brachioradialis muscle, this muscle right here up along the elbow, which, by the way, a lot of people have pain in their elbow up here from oh, working out common. and stuff, right? What do they call it? A golfer's elbow or tennis elbow? Tennis elbow, yeah. This muscle tends to be underdeveloped in a lot of people, especially people that lift weights. So hammer curls gives a nice full look to the bicep in, com in combination with the barbell curl. It also develops this really important muscle that attaches the forearm that also helps flex the elbow. So Yeah, yeah so I'll... <laughs> This is kind of one of those uh, that I I'm gonna see what you guys think because <laughs> this is this is literally like this is my favorite combo and I'm I would not swing like, the Indian clubs. I feel like I'm out of my realm here with this bicep, you know, this specific muscle. But so I like to do chin ups, so supinated chin ups oh, okay. yeah. to start, and you get that full range of motion. It's nasty, right? So you know, just focused on that, and then my favorite combo to follow that up. Uh, is actually a dumbbell alternating curl, but like on a um, incline bench, and then letting them hang uh, in in this position here. So right. like one comes up while the other one is in the stretched position, and then I alternate oh, that. I love that. And it just uh, yeah, it's a good feeling. Destroys my my biceps. I love that. I yeah. can get down with both those. I mean, I think I think you get. Uh, you, I like what both here. I'd have a slight modification probably to Sal's, the barbell curls, I would actually do a spider curl with the rotation, right? So I'm getting kind of the hammer. I would actually start in like a hammer curl position hanging over the spider yeah. curl and then actually fully rotate yeah. and lead with my pinkies and then rope rotate back down hmm. so I can incorporate some of what you're trying to target. Plus, I love the spider curl to kind of focus on the squeeze and the peak, right? So you're at the, the top of the exercise. And then, of course, the barbell, just a standard barbell curl has to be in there. Those two together yeah. would be probably one of now, my Now, I want to add something to what mm -hmm. Justin said about chin-ups because I, I'm sure there's going to be people, especially on YouTube, like, chin-ups, that's a back exercise. Okay. Palms up supinated grip chin-ups with an emphasis on the bicep. So if I'm yes. pulling from my back, my chest is up and I'm squeezing my back. If I'm pulling from my biceps, I'm not pulling my chest up yeah. and I'm squeezing the biceps at the top. You could change the focus. Really this easy. is a compound lift for your biceps, yeah. okay? There is nothing that, I promise you, Try first of all, you gotta be strong enough to do it this way. If you are, you will not find a bicep exercise that will ham. Think about compound lifts for other body parts compared to isolation lifts. You just found a compound lift for your biceps. It's a huge muscle builder. It's hard to do for a lot of people, even people who could do pull-ups. When you show them how to do it for the biceps, it can be really hard. But holy cow, that one builds the biceps. It's really, really tough. It's to all it's all about the cues on this one, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm cueing somebody for biceps, it's pull the bar into the chest. Yes. If I'm cueing someone for back, it's pull the back. Or pull the chest to the, the bar. The bar pull, yeah. Excuse me, pull the chest into the bar, mm -hmm. right? So that's where the cues are yeah. different. Uh, so that people are not making it a back exercise. So you could very easily change that slight cue right there. It makes a tremendous difference. Yeah, and I'm telling playing. you, it's a nasty exercise. Yeah. I had a gymnast that worked for me once that taught, taught me all about it, and I went up and I did like five reps. I yeah. was like, holy yeah. cow. Yeah. Can't do very many. Yeah, it's a whole new thing. All right, so let's get to triceps. Triceps, um, I have a combo here. I have a pretty strong case for that I really like to combine the two. Now, the first exercise is your your traditional parallel bar dips. It's hard to find, in my opinion, uh, a better tricep, compound tricep exercise that's more functional. Some, someone might argue a close grip bench press. I could see that argument. Mm -hmm. But dips, it's your body. It's hard. It's very rare that we actually push our bodies up in that direction. Great tricep exercise. You can use a lot of weight. Obviously, use your body weight. Some people can actually strap weight to their, to their bodies. And then the second exercise is an overhead tricep extension, dumbbell cable, doesn't matter. Why the overhead extension? 
because it's the only position where you actually stretch the long head of the tricep. So if I tell you to stretch your tricep right now, those of you that know how to do it will probably stretch it like this, right? You bring your elbow up to your head and bring it across. What you're feeling is the long head of the tricep because it attaches near the scapula. That stretch position means you're going to hit the tricep totally different, a different area. It's going to hit the long head, which is also this part of the tricep that gets less activation on dips. So you go dips, mm -hmm. overhead tricep extension, you get this nice kind of full effect on the triceps. It's one I've done since I was a kid. One of my favorite combinations. Yeah, so somewhat similar. I mean, I love dips personally too. Uh, I like to intensify dips in terms of stability. So if, if you have access to it, I know this is not like the most accessible way to do this, but uh, I love ring dips. I mean, it's the most uh, intense uh, there's ways to scale it in terms of like uh, progression and regression, um, but if you can, if you have the ability to do it, uh, there's nothing more demanding than a ring dip in terms of like being able to get those triceps to you know produce the strength in order to get you into full extension, and then following that up uh, with with skull crushers, uh, you know, with the easy bar. Yeah, very uh, very very close to the overhead so, triceps. Yeah, yeah, it's close, so you yeah. get that same kind of stretch position uh, to follow that up. Yeah, the the only thing I mean, I can't. I'm not going to debate this that this these aren't the king, right? Dip. It's hard to debate that dips are not king for for tricep exercise. Um, although personally, um, you would find me probably doing the the close grip uh, incline bench press one. Just it's comfortable. Uh, it's easy. I feel like I can, you can load, load it substantially. I can load it even even more. Um, it also, again, the bias I have is it was one of those exercises that I've talked on the show before that when I started to incorporate it, yeah, it's it game changer. For yeah, you. it took a it took my triceps to a whole nother level. And I had already done kind of dips before, but I'm sure you could argue the case that if the reverse was true, if I did, you know, incline press all the time, and then I finally yeah. did dips, I might have felt the same thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I incline, uh, incline, close grip bench press, um, or dips easy one and two for me. And then the overhead extensions, a hundred percent. And so long as you have the shoulder mobility to be able to get your, mm -hmm. your hands behind your head like that. Otherwise I would probably do a variation like Justin, uh, said, and that's the only reason why I would do one or the other is based off the client, which one is they're more capable yeah, and of if, doing. If you really want to focus on the stretch on that overhead tricep extension, use a rope and use a cable because you could go down real. Sometimes a dumbbell gets in the way and hits your back, yeah. mm -hmm. but with the rope, you can go wait and get that crazy stretch at the bottom mm -hmm. and the pump is insane and, and if you've never done them that way uh, prepare yourself because loading a stretched muscle tends to produce more soreness i yeah. i even used to like to do that uh, single arm so i'd grab the rope oh, and yeah. i'd actually take my other other arm so i can hold my elbow in a fixed position and keep there so i'm not cheating it out which that's another thing too you'll see when people kind of do the over they'll flare the totally. elbows out or the rock or they won't go through full range of motion but taking it with one arm using the other arm to hold in that fixed position while i just focus on the, the full extension is a great exercise yeah i want to comment on your on your close grip uh, incline press and this is true for a flat uh, close grip press. When I was younger, I thought close grip meant really close, like thumbs oh, yeah, touching. And it's, but boy, is that awkward on the wrists? It actually causes impingement issues in the wrist. It doesn't feel very good. Really, a close grip is about mm. shoulder width. Maybe yeah. a, maybe a little bit inside so your shoulders. Elbows at the most. can just slide. Like yeah, and and it's not that your elbows your, and your uh, elbows ribs. do come close to your body. But what's also important is that your hands come above your elbow. So you're getting that. So that's, that so yeah. this is how I decide, right? Everybody always, I remember when I used to teach this exercise, oh, where do I grab here? Like, yeah. don't look at the bar on where to grab. Put your elbows and that's where your by go. your side and that's where your hands go. So line mm -hmm. it up first by going, okay, I'm going to tuck my elbows in right by my side and then wherever my hands are, that's where I'm grabbing the bar. So don't think of it as like, oh, grab between these lines or grab right yes. here. It's like, put your, because everybody's going to be different. If you have a very wide, wide back and, and width, you're going to be further out than somebody who's a lot more narrow. So don't look at it as where you're grabbing the bar. Get your elbows in the position first and then kind of look at where the, where you'd be grabbing the bar. That's where you yeah, grab and the bar. So it's important. Remember, the hands come up above the elbow. So I'm not doing a press where the bar is coming down my belly button. No. My elbow, my, my hands come up here because that's the tricep action. Otherwise, it's like front delt. I'm doing kind of a front delt raise mm -hmm. right. with my presses. All right. So let's talk about the, the core. So the abs, the obliques, uh, the internal external obliques, right? The muscles that we like to show off at the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, Well-developed core contributes to so much uh, in every other exercise, especially standing exercises. Very important you train this properly. I like the perfect sit-up to start with. So mm. perfect sit-up is very slow. You're articulating, uh, you're trying to articulate every vertebrae as you go from laying flat to rolling your body up. 
works the uh, the abdominal muscles fully. If you engage your TVA while you're doing it, like you're kind of drawing it at the same time, you're working your TVA a bit. Obliques are stabilizing. It's a great ex overall exercise for the core. To make it easier for some people, you can reach forward with your hands. If you want to make it more challenging, you keep your hands by your shoulders or behind your head, which just makes the lever uh, yeah. heavier at the end and it makes it more challenging. Then to combine with that, I like cable chops. Mm. Cable chops, great rotational exercise, great for the obliques. Um, the obliques and rotation are very important for stabilization. For aesthetics, you want nicely developed obliques. Don't listen to those idiots that say don't yeah. work your obliques. It makes your waist grow. If you're lean and you have well developed obliques, even if your inch grows a quarter of an excuse me, even if your waist grows a quarter of an inch, your waist is going to look better. Um, so those cable chops really work the obliques nicely through a really functional. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you included that one. It's a great functional movement uh, to uh, in terms of like how it's structured. I, I love decline sit-ups mm. is, is one to start with. And just because using those gravitational forces and like, honestly, like, like crunches or sit-ups or uh, the, the real focus has to be like the intent of what you're doing. And so the technique of it is everything. So if you're just, adding weight or you're hanging from, I, I don't like adding like, like hanging uh, leg raises or anything like that. Cause I feel like people like will have more of a tendency to do them wrong. Yep. Uh, and so I, what I like about the uh, decline setup, it, it really places you in a good position. Um, and then, you know, you could slowly methodically go down through range of motion, come up and really like feel each, you know, ab, like get activated and, and, and go through that, uh, that sit up. Uh, and then if later, if you want to add weight to that cool, uh, or just, you know, intensify it by going even slower. Uh, and then to, to the functional, uh, sort of point, I would follow that up with a landmine rotation, trunk rotation. And I like that because I can add, you know, load to that and it keeps everything kind of tight and controlled and you get a lot of that, you know, yeah. ro rotational strength, you get the obliques, you get everything else uh, that your core, uh, you know, is has has as a function that we need to strengthen. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna choose a different one for for core slash abs, um, and it's actually one that Sal, you, I, which I was surprised you didn't go this direction because it was an exercise that you. Uh, showed me the first time. I think I don't think I ever did it before. And that was actually on the stability ball and then putting your feet up like on the wall and doing like a, a crunch on the stability yeah. ball. Mm -hmm. I And since we're talking about core and not just directly hitting the abs, the stability component that you get with that and then also the full range of motion because you're opening up over the ball. So you get kind of like where you're trying to target with the perfect setup because like that's a, that is a great one where you're getting the full range of motion. It's nice and control. I like that same concept, but done on the stability ball because now we have a stability component in that. That's really going to hit it. And then going to some sort of a chop, whether it's a medicine ball toss or, you know, swinging a club or just doing a regular cable chop, I think to get some rotational component there, that combo is is a, is a must. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the, what you guys said, I, I, I don't think is any worse or better than what I said. I think those are all great uh, combinations. Um, all right, calves. Now, this changed for me, okay? So in the past, I would have said, Standing calf raises to seated calf raises because you're you're working the, the whole part of the calf, the gastroc, which is the big meaty part of the calf when you're standing. And then when you're seated and that with your knees bent, you're working the soleus, which is this kind of flat muscle underneath the gastrocs that really gets worked when you're seated. Okay, that's what I normally would have said. And that's a fine combo. It's a great muscle building combo, great for aesthetics. But here's what I'm going to say now. I'm going to say instead of standing calf raises, I'll say jump rope. So jump rope to seated calf raises. Now, why jump rope? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys a story that I just recently experienced. Now, I train my calves. I do standing calf raises. I do seated calf raises. Well, a couple weeks ago, I wanted to do uh, explosive pushes with the sled where I'm driving, but I'm actually trying to sprint. It's loaded, so I'm not really running fast. But the idea is to be explosive and push it across our, our turf. Mm -hmm. Great workout. I'm trying to build my, my work capacity a little bit, train my legs a little explosively. Well, anyway... A couple days later, my Achilles was sore on my right side. Now, I know that my calves can handle the load, but they couldn't handle the explosiveness of the movement because I never trained them that way. Mm -hmm. And if you think about in, in real life how functional the calves are, the calves pro in everyday life, you're probably not going to, I mean, unless things happen to you, you're not going to use lots of explosive ability for the rest of your body. I'm not saying you shouldn't train it. I think there's lots of carryover. In fact, we did an episode on explosive movements and their value. 
But if there's anything that does require some level of explosiveness, it's your calves, right? Because you're walking, you're uphill, downhill. You might need to jump or take a step. A little bit of an explosive component to calves, so it's probably a good idea that you train them that way a little bit. Now, jump rope, a little more advanced. You got to start really, really slow. Don't go into fatigue. You will fry your body. So I would say practice jump rope for a little bit and then do seated calf raises. Yeah. I surprised I, you with that, didn't I, Justin? I feel like you stole my uh, <laughs> my jump rope. So I, I'll have to add then, um, uh, basically, I I love like ice skaters. I know this is like sort of one that uh, a lot of people just, they'll fall all over the place. And I, I find a lot of value in terms of functional uh, ability to control uh, a lot of like lateral forces. So um, especially around the ankle. Ankle is one of those things that just inevitably anybody does something that's a little bit fast, a little bit explosive, like the ankle is so susceptible uh, to, to injury and strain. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, building and reinforcing the stabilizing components around the ankles and also in the calves are going to be expressed quite substantially, like, you know, explosively moving left to right, uh, it, or just like it just box jumps, I guess would be great for that mm -hmm. as well. But I mean, yeah, uh, um, jump ropes would have been the ideal uh, movement there. But, uh, after that, uh, I, I love just a, a heavy grinding, um, either sled drive or, you know, hill sprints. And that's, again, this is me just completely functionally not caring about like the overall hypertrophy of my calves, more so the function of them. Yeah. So. But I'll argue a really good hill sprinter who does really good, right. You know, box jumps or sk ice skaters. Probably gonna have well developed. They're gonna calves. have yeah. They're gonna get the frequency and they're gonna get yeah. uh, the volume and all that. But uh, yeah, in terms of load, it may be less. So I'm not qualified to answer this question. So <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, you're very qualified you. because <laughs> yeah. that's been a body part of yours. You've had to work real hard. Yeah, on yeah. And no, you've I'm, made some progress. You gained like I'm, I'm, I'm it, teasing, it right? some so. veins, dude. You're <laughs> yeah, I just get I just add veins. That's what happens. In my, yeah. uh, <laughs> No, so I, uh, I I I love the jump rope angle for sure, and the sprinting component. I I don't have much to to disagree with that. The only thing that no one did touch that I would add or I might combo. So seated calf raise has got to be in there. It's got to have a bent knee. I th I feel like that component needs yeah. to be in there. Um, then the other one will be a donkey calf raise with that. Oh, so I I love because you're kind of that's a going, straight bodybuilder move. I love yeah, that. Yeah, donkey calf raise first. Uh, and then go to a, a seated calf raise after that. And I just, you want to talk about completely hitting the entire calf, fullest range of motion on it. Um, I think that's an extra. And then maybe something that's neglected, which I think jump rope would actually get this, is the front. Nobody, we don't ever tibialis. focus on tibialis. Wow, and what tibialis a great is, point. is a neglected. And, you know, when, when I did focus a lot on my calves when I was competing, um, I would actually, between sets, would just do the... Toe raise yeah, thing or whatever. the toe raises where I'm just kind of tapping, and yep. then the Gold's Gym over when I'd be at Bernal over there, they actually had the. Uh, there's rarely ever do you see that tibialis machine, but every once in a while you'll see one in there where you slide your foot in and you can load it with a couple mm -hmm. pounds on each side. Um, it just even though you're not targeting the the gastroc or the soleus, but it just gets a fuller look. And so if you're chasing looks, uh, that was I think one of those like little secret weapons. Bro, I'm so there. glad you said that. Mm -hmm. The the number one cause of Shin splints, which is very common. Very common. Everybody gets shin splints that I would train. Anytime they try to run or the hiking, like, oh, my shins really hurt. It's weakness in the tibialis. All I would yeah. do is strengthen their tibialis. Shin splints would be totally gone. And of course, we'd have to work on some flexibility stuff. But what a great, that's totally true. Nobody ever trains their tibialis. And I'll tell you, you have well-developed calves and then you go and you try to run for a little bit, you'll get sore in your tibialis. Yeah, you'll get sore in the time. shins because totally. you never train them. So look, there you have it. We just gave you two just great combinations of exercises for every body part. If you wrote these all down, you can actually make yourself a great workout just based off of all of that. Now, look, if you want more free information from us, I suggest you go over to Mind Pump Media, excuse me, mindpumpfree.com. At mindpumpfree.com, we have all these guides that are free that can help you work on your legs or your arms or your shoulders or your midsection. We have guides to help you with your squat. Uh, we have guides for personal trainers. So again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.